Hello. Hello. Thank you for being here. My name is Alex. I'm a product manager on Amazon Machine Learning. This talk is about Amazon Machine Learning. Who here in the audience is for something here for something other than machine learning? Anybody? No? Great. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for coming to the last session of the day that overlaps with the happy hour. This is a real sacrifice. I appreciate it. I hope I'll make it worth your while. Um, I, will, um, I will try to not take too much of your time, and we'll run and hopefully finish on time. I want to talk to you about Amazon Machine Learning, and really I want to get started by talking about what is machine learning? What is its place in the whole data ecosystem? I want to talk a little bit about how smart applications are built. I'll show you an example. I'll show you a counterexample. I think counterexamples are really instructive for learning something new. I'll talk about the um, Amazon Machine Learning product, what are some features and benefits are. And then to um, dive into details, I want to, I'll, I'll show you a little bit about the, uh, I'll, I'll show you a few of the data flow diagrams. I want to show you how applications can be built with Amazon Machine Learning end to end. And there will be plenty of time at the end for Q&A, where's the last session of the day, so I can stick around longer if needed. So, I think a really good way to set up talking about machine learning is to consider its place in the total data-driven development cycle. And the most common type of data-driven development you are likely to see, or you probably have experienced out there, is retrospective analysis and reporting. So you have a data set already. You may store it in flat files in Amazon S3. You may put it into relational database tables managed by Amazon RDS. You may have it in the data warehouse, such as Amazon Redshift. No matter where your data is, you know you can go back and query the data. You can find out something interesting about what has happened in the past. Lots of tools to do that. And it's really valuable. It's really valuable to be able to go back in time and ask the question of, well, what has happened in the past? What can we learn from it? There is one stage that goes beyond the retrospective analysis, and that's the here and now development. It's being able to ask a question about your business not as it was several weeks or several days or several hours ago, but what's happening right now. And we often see our customers use tools like Amazon Kinesis to ingest large volumes of data and process them in real time, or to build applications with um, compute services like Amazon EC2 or AWS Lambda that act on real-time data streams as they come in and immediately tell you something about what's going on. So the simplest example here is building a dashboard, knowing what your business is doing right now just by glancing at it. Well, there is one more stage beyond that. And that's predictions. It's this ability to go and ask the question of not what happened in the past, not even what's happening right now, but to make a reasonable forecast about what is going to happen in the future. We can really build a new breed of applications that look forward instead of back. It's pretty exciting. And so that brings us to machine learning. And what is machine learning? Uh, who here in the audience thinks that machine learning is a really uh, unknowable, magical thing that just works. I see no hands, which is fantastic, because that is not what machine learning is. Uh, there are many definitions. The definition I really like for machine learning is it's simply technology that looks for patterns in the data you already have and uses these patterns to make predictions on new data records as they become available. Pretty general. There is no magic here. It's well-understood technology. And the key to this is not actually technology. The key is your data. If you don't have data that has some kind of a signal in it that can be used to find the patterns, then machine learning technology will not help you. But as we, as many of our customers have realized, lots of the data sets that are already available have all kinds of really valuable patterns in them. And these patterns can be used to build predictive applications or to build machine learning models that can in turn be used to build predictive applications. So what kind of applications are these? So here are a few examples. We see these all the time. 
starting with what we know about a user, a customer of yours. We can ask all kinds of questions. We can ask, will they use your product? How much will they use it? Will they only use the free version or will they convert? Are they the kind of customer who will become a high spender? And these are really valuable things to know. You can, cha you can change things about your product. You can change things about your sales cycle. You can change things about how your business operates if you could look forward in the future and ask a question like that. It doesn't have to be at the level of an individual customer. We can look at an order, for example, and we can ask important, thing, important questions, like is this order fraudulent? At Amazon Retail, it's a question which is um, very valuable and re um, relevant to us. Is this order fraudulent? Is this, does it look abnormal? Should somebody follow up on that order? Should that order be canceled outright? We really need to know. And we can also look at a piece of content, such as a news article, and we can ask questions like, is this news article relevant to this specific person who is looking at it? What other pieces of content are relevant? What is interesting? What should we uh, show next? Just three examples of smart application. Um, I can spend an hour talking about the examples. There are many more, but we see specifically machine learning be used in these verticals. We see a lot of use in fraud detection, in personalization, in any kind of targeted marketing or customer-based segmentation, content classification of any kind, especially free text, unstructured content, churn prediction, customer support, the list goes on. If you have a business problem that looks like one of these, then I hope you'll consider machine learning as one of the technologies, or perhaps you already have, in which case I would love to tell you a little more about Amazon machine learning specifically. But before we go there, I promised I would show you a counterexample, so I, w I, want to, um, I want to walk you through it. Consider this email. Here is an email I received. Um, it says, Dear Alex, this awesome quadcopter is on sale, just $49.99. This email happens to be very well targeted. I'm really interested in playing around with uh, small aerial toys like a quadcopter, and I was thinking about buying one, and this email just showed up. How convenient is that? Question is, how did this email come to be? Um, let's say we have a, uh, an engineer, and the engineer has access to our production database, and we ask them, find me the list of all customers to whom I should send this promotional email. What would they do? Well, here's a really simple way to get started. Let's just uh, run a SQL query. Let's just find all customers to whom, uh, who made an order in the last 30 days, and say, well, that's our list. Let's send an email to all of them. It's easy to do. It's, uh, depending on your viewpoint, it's either nearly worthless or entirely worthless. Uh, there is a fine distinction in there. Because just placing an order in the last 30 days does not tell me anything about this customer's intent to really buy this quadcopter. It just says that they've placed an order. Uh, it's OK. We can make the query better. Why don't we restrict it to only customers who bought something from the toys category? so we don't confuse them with folks who bought something from the um, books category or from the auto parts category. It's a little better, but not a whole lot better. But you might say, we have our whole database and I know SQL. We can make this query a whole lot more complex. So now we will join our customers to products and we'll ask, well, give me only the customers who bought products whose description had the word helicopter in them in the last 60 days or those who made at least two purchases uh, that summed up to at least $200 in the last 30 days. Uh, there is a lot going on in here. Is this any better? I don't know, I don't think so. You know, if it is better than very fractionally so. But we're not done yet. We have uh, all kinds of things we could do. We can change our query to look at a wildcard match for, for a copter. So we're not only looking at helicopters, we're also only looking for quadcopters. And we can go back further in time. We can change a number. We can change another number. We can change a third number. And this will fail. We can spend a lot of time doing this, but the result will be failure. And the reason it's a failure is because all we're doing is changing some magic numbers around. There is no real um, 
strategy behind it is just trying to find a list of customers that matches some criteria and we don't know how to find it. And this is what machine learning gives us. Machine learning gives us ability to get rid of magic numbers and replace them instead with numbers or with rules that are derived from the data. So we can really look at who has purchased items like this in the past and find from them customers who are, more li who are likely to make a purchase like this in the future. And then we can send these emails and then I get a well-targeted email and I buy a quadcopter instead of marking this junk and maybe unsubscribing from, the, uh, from your customer list. So, so far so good. You might ask a question, why aren't there more smart applications? This seems really straightforward. And from speaking with our customers, we really see three main reasons. First is machine learning expertise is rare. Second, it's actually really hard to build and scale out machine learning technology. It's not, um, it's not for the faint-hearted in, in most cases. And third, just because you have a machine learning model, it doesn't mean that you have an application that can actually use this model in real world. It doesn't mean that you can start really reaping the benefits of machine learning. Well, I want to dig into this a little bit. So let's talk about expertise for a second. Uh, the fact is there is a very limited supply of data scientists out there. Companies of all, size, all sizes cannot find enough data scientists to fill um, all the jobs that are available. This is true of small startups. This is true of large companies like Amazon. It's true in every industry. There is just not enough data scientists to go around. There is always the outsourcing option, and that works well in some cases, but it can also get very expensive. On the technology side, I would not claim that there is such thing as a um, limited supply of machine learning technology. Quite the opposite. There are so many choices out there. It's a really great time to be doing machine learning. But what we find is that the, um, the flip side of having so many choices is there are many pieces of software that only do one thing well and other things not so well or maybe not at all. We find that a lot of software out there that's commonly used for machine learning is, has been created with the intention of building machine learning models primarily and not so much with the intention of building applications that use these models. So oftentimes there are popular software toolkits out there that suffer from not being able to scale to a large volume of data or not being able to give you predictions back at low latency. And there are so many moving pieces that when we talk to our customers, we talk to teams within Amazon internally who use machine learning, we find often that even though they start with off-the-shelf machine learning technology, they end up writing a ton of code to tie different pieces of software together. They end up creating custom solutions and there is not a lot of reuse happening between solutions. You know, you, every solution becomes a custom one. And then over on the operationalization angle, this is where I really see, unfortunately, a lot of machine learning projects fail. It is, again, the difference between having a model and actually using that model. Having a workflow that's reliable for building models as new data comes in. Having an API that stands up in front of it that is reasonable to use and runs, uh, to, runs well with the rest of your business logic. Have, having a model management lifestyle, uh, life cycle, so that you are able to know which models are running right now, what data have they been bu built on, how long have they been in production, how are they doing. All of these things do not come, do not just show up for free. A lot of our customers end up writing a lot of this from scratch. And the end result is that what should be a fairly straightforward machine learning based application becomes something that takes a long time to build, it's expensive, it's really risky. So we ask in AWS, as we often do, what if there were a better way? And this is what led us to building and um, Amazon machine learning and making it available to all of our customers in AWS. Amazon machine learning is an easy to use machine learning service that is built as a completely managed solution. It, it runs in the cloud, there are no servers to manage, there is no software to install and upgrade, we take care of all those details. 
it is a service that is built with developer as the target audience. We have, um, I would say, all stripes of uh, customers using the service, starting from developers who don't have any machine learning experience today, all the way to data scientists who do uh, have experience with using other solutions but choose Amazon Machine Learning for some of the reasons that I'll describe in a few minutes here. But we really wanted to focus on making machine learning accessible to developers because these are the folks who are in the best position today to build these smart applications. They're already familiar with the data. They're already familiar with the business problems. All they're lacking is a good technology solution to move forward. Now, as far as technology behind Amazon Machine Learning goes, it is based on some of the same technologies that powers uh, Amazon.com. Uh, we have we first developed the um, the platform and a lot of the learning engine and so on behind Amazon Machine Learning for internal use. It's been running inside Amazon for years. We process hundreds of billions of predictions through these systems on monthly basis. We feel that it's ready to be exposed to our customers, to you, and it has it has been proven in production. We, of course, went and um, made sure that Amazon Machine Learning is really well integrated with all the other services that you may already be using in the AWS cloud. So these are the data stores, these are the security management, these are the monitoring services. All of these work as you would expect them to as an AWS customer together with Amazon Machine Learning. And finally, we... Um, wanted to really tackle this problem of having this enormous gap between having a model and having an application that uses this model. We want to eliminate this production deployment uh, gap in both technology and in time. And so I have a talking point here that it, uh, models can be deployed to productions in seconds. It's a little bit of a lie because depending on how you use the models, there is either a one-click, several-second long deployment step, or there is no deployment step. You can just use the model as is. All depends on which API you use, what your use case is. All right, uh, to focus just a little more on ease of use and developer friendliness. What we've learned from our own experiences and also talking to many of our customers about building machine learning models is there are often, or there are usually actually, two stages to building your machine learning model. There is one stage that I would describe broadly as experimentation. So you start out with a data set, you build a model, you find out how good that model is, you get some insights, you go back and iterate and build the next model. And for that, what makes most sense is to have some kind of interactive tool, a uh, front end. And in Amazon machine learning case, it's our service console. But then there is the other part of the life cycle where you already have your machine learning model and it's time to build your application. It's time to really set this up and have it run at the scale and volume of your business. And for that, interactive tools do not do. You want an API. You want to use this, the, the, you want to use the machine learning technology as another technology service. And so what we've done with Amazon machine learning is we've built both. There is a very capable graphical front end that you can use to build your models, evaluate them, uh, understand the um, distribution of the data, understand something about the performance of the model in, in terms of your own business use case. And then when you're ready to go to production, there is a full featured API that you can use, not only to get predictions, but to automate your entire modeling lifecycle. For example, to automatically retrain models or create new models when new data becomes available to evaluate them and to make decisions or to build whole applications that respond to events to either generate predictions or affect your machine learning model. So we didn't want you to have to choose between one of these two worlds as many toolkits out there today for force you to with build both. Another thing we don't like to do in AWS is to force our customers to choose a language or a platform. We support whatever it is that you want to use to build your applications. So Amazon Machine Learning is an API, but of course we, re we release rich client SDKs and we build them for Java, for Python, .NET, JavaScript, Ruby, PHP. We even built mobile prediction support directly into our mobile SDK. Whatever it is that you like to use, 
you should be able to use it with Amazon Machine Learning. If there is something you like to use that's not on that list, stick around, tell me, and I'll make sure that we go back and look at it. Next, I want to talk a little bit about technology. I've mentioned already that Amazon Machine Learning is based on the same systems that we've been running within Amazon.com for a long time. But when I talk about technology, I don't mean just the learning algorithm. The learning algorithm is important, but it's not the whole story. There is also technology, for example, in taking the data that you provide as an input and transforming it to get the best signal out of that data. In machine learning terms, it's known as feature engineering. And so we do quite a bit of this within the service. We have a little language built into the service that allows you to enter raw data and specify transformations. We have some technologies that suggest transformations based on your specific data set. And we have lots of industry best practices built in. You might train a model and want to evaluate this model and you, it, you may let it slip your mind that evaluations only make sense if the data you use to evaluate the model is incredibly similar in its distribution to the data that's used to train the model. Well, we help you get this whole thing sorted out first by taking your data and offering to automatically split it up into training and evaluation set, and there are a few different strategies for that. And second, by actually alerting you if the training and evaluation data don't look the same. We took a whole bunch of different industry best practices and we baked them right into the product to help you get results more reliably and faster, just help you avoid make mistakes. And then, of course, we want to make sure that the technology we built scales. So today, you can use Amazon Machine Learning to train on up to 100 gigabytes of data. You can generate billions and billions of predictions. I think I've mentioned that we do several hundred billions predictions on monthly basis within Amazon, just with Amazon as a customer, using the same technology. And you can get these predictions in whatever way makes the most sense for your business application. If you need predictions in large, in large batches, you can get them that way. If you have an application that needs predictions in real time and it needs them at low latency and at high throughput, you can get them this way. The choice is entirely yours. A quick note on integration with data that you may already have in the AWS ecosystem. Amazon Machine Learning can trivially access CSV files that live in Amazon S3. And S3 acts as this um, universal data store. It's the data lake into which every provider of data can find a way to output a CSV file uh, and upload into S3. If you have data that's stored in the MySQL database that's managed with Amazon RDS, um, Amazon Machine Learning can access that directly. If you have data that's stored in Redshift, Amazon Machine Learning can access that, take an arbitrary SQL query from you, run the query, get the results, run on that. Predictions in batch mode are output back into S3, from which you can pick it up and use it again in just about every product in the world. And of course, there is full integration with identity and access management to make sure that you can build the security story you need around machine learning, both in who can access models, who can build models, who can change model properties. It's all available and it's all under your control. And um, one last point I will chat about is um, what does it mean to be fully managed? Well, we take it to the extreme. When we say fully managed, we mean that you should not have to bring up a server or a computer of any kind to use machine learning or use Amazon machine learning. So it is a managed fleet that we run so you don't have to. There is one click production model deployment or no click depending on how you use the API. There is a full model management, uh, model metadata management built right in so you can build a model and then later you can come back and ask a question. How was this model built? What, uh, what data was it built from? What were the different settings? What data transformations were applied? All of that is metadata that's stored with the model, so you don't have to build another tracking system just to store the metadata. And of course, we connect to um, a Amazon CloudWatch so you can get metrics on the model usage. And um, at this point, somebody usually asks me, well, how much does it cost? You know, I'm not going to do the whole, how much would you pay? You know, $1 million, $2 million, no. Um, the pricing for Amazon Machine Learning is really straightforward. 
we charge 42 cents per compute hour for all activities leading to making models. So it's data analysis, it's model training, it's model evaluation, 42 cents per instance hour is all it takes. And then predictions are priced at 10 cents per thousand or $100 per million equivalently. The predictions can be obtained in batches or in real time. If you use the real time interface, there is a small capacity charge to make sure that the endpoint that is capable of giving you predictions back at low latency with no warm up time is up and running. It's small for most of our customers, it's well under 1% of their total Amazon machine learning bill. And that's all. These are the only dimensions for the pricing. So what can you actually do with Amazon machine learning? There are three fundamental kinds of machine learning tasks that we support, and these are by and far the most common in the industry. I would say 80% of all machine learning out there is one of these three things, uh, one of these three tasks. There is binary classification, where you predict a, an answer to a yes or no question. For example, you look at an order and you say, is this order fraudulent, yes or no? You look at a customer and you ask, will this customer respond to this marketing offer, yes or no? Uh, you can even build ranking experiences on that, and I'll show a little more about this later on. Then you have a multi-class classification, which extends the classification paradigm to account for more than one option. So you might look at a movie and you might ask a question, what genre is this movie? You have a taxonomy, you have to pick one. Uh, you might look at the customer contact, incoming customer service support, and you might ask, what is the root cause? What is this customer contacting me about? A great example of multi-class classification. And finally, you have numeric regression, where you look at a number, and you try to predict the number directly. So if you're in real estate game, you might ask, how much will this house sell for? You might look at an application, a customer using your application, and you might ask, how long will this session last before this customer finishes? You might ask, how long before this customer comes back? Uh, you may uh, be in retail business, and you might ask, how many units of this product will I sell next week? All examples of regression. So these are three are incredibly general in their application. And there is a lot, uh, you know, again, upwards of 80% in my estimation of all the use cases out there are examples of binary classification, multi-class classification, or regression. So let me show you what it actually looks like to build a smart application with Amazon Machine Learning. We have three main steps here. We start off by training our model from the historical data. We follow up by evaluating the model, and is this really crucial, by optimizing the model to align with your business requirements. And finally, once our model is ready to go, we deploy it and we use it to get predictions. So let's start with the training step. I will show you a few screenshots of uh, what um, the process looks like. I won't drag you through the um, full experience in the console, but I'll show you screenshots from the console. And I'll also show you a few code snippets uh, to illustrate equivalent operations uh, using, a, um, using the API. So we start off by creating a data source object. A data source is just an object that holds all kinds of metadata about the actual data that you want to use for machine learning. It, um, it stores information on where to find this data, what format is it in, is it in, what are the descriptive statistics on this data, and so on. So we can just walk through a quick wizard to create it. We start off, here we are asked if the data is stored in S3 or Redshift. We pick S3, fill out uh, the location field, and we're off into the next field where we get to configure the data schema. Amazon Machine Learning looks at your data and automatically tries to detect which fields are what type, which fields are numeric, categorical, text, or binary. You have a choice here to verify and override these decisions. Next, you specify the target variable. This, this is the things that you actually want to predict. So if you are, are building an application that predicts whether an order is fraudulent, you start out with past examples of your orders and the target says, was this order actually fraudulent or not? You know that because the fraudulent ones are the ones that were declined by the bank later on. And so here you select the name of the variable that contains the answer to the question we're asking. At training time, we have, an we have access to this because we have historical data. When we actually get predictions, this is the thing that we're predicting. So we select the um, name of the target attribute. 
uh, reviews the steps, and off we go. Here is an equivalent uh, code snippet to do the same thing using the Python SDK. And as I mentioned, there are SDKs for um, all kinds of languages you can use. I use Python here just because it's the most compact. It's easiest to fit on the slide. Uh, it's, it's an important consideration. So we, we configure here the location of the data, the location of the data schema. We pass in a flag called compute statistics, and off it goes. What does this compute statistics flag give us? Well, one thing it gives us is it gives us um, access to browse through and visualize the data that you fed in immediately inside Amazon Machine Learning. And we find it an incredibly powerful way to find irregularities in your data. Uh, all data sets are fundamentally misshapen or broken in some way, but you never know how. The easiest way to find out is to look at the data. So here we can look at a data source and we can zoom in on our target visualization and um, just see, does it align with our uh, understanding? Like if I was, if I was uh, predicting whether orders are fraudulent or not, I see here that this, this visualization tells me that most of my orders are not fraudulent or zero. If this aligns with my understanding, great. If it doesn't align with my understanding, then, well, I have two problems. I have a data problem and I have a high fraud, fraud rate problem. We don't have to look just at a target. We can look at descriptive statistics for all the different variables. And um, there are different visualizations for different data types. We can uh, zoom further and further into the data. And primarily what I tend to use this for is again, finding irregularities. If I was looking at a variable called day a week, I expect the histogram for that to have seven values. If I have eight values, well, this will show me what is the eighth value. Is it something like question mark? Is it NA? How many of them are there? I can actually go as far as to click on any bar and look at sample data records that match this condition. It's really effortless to swim through this data right inside the service console without going back, downloading the data, putting it into another visualization tool and so on. It's really convenient. And there are visualizations, as I've mentioned, for different data types. For numerics, we'll show you a true histogram and let you browse around, for text will show you most frequent words and so on and so forth. So we looked at the data, let's go ahead and make a model. Also a wizard, we start off by specifying the name of the data source we created earlier that points to our data. Uh, here we get to choose what kind of a model it is and whether we go with default pass or custom. I'll hit default here, get to review step. What we're looking at here is I want to show really quick, this is the data recipe. And this is a small custom data transformation language we built into the system. So if you have, for example, a, um, a variable like a text variable, like the contents of a customer email, well, you're not gonna look at it if you take the entire variable and treat it just as a byte stream because every customer email is unique. You will learn a lot by breaking it up into individual words or a group of words and then learning signal from those words well, it's really easy to do something like this with Amazon Machine Learning data recipes because all you can do is, all you have to do is say, take this variable and apply this transformation to it. In our case, it's n-gram transformation. You don't have to actually do the transformation yourself. You don't have to serialize the transformed data to disk, which is going to blow it up in volume by one or two orders of magnitude. All you have to do is tell Amazon Machine Learning what to do, what transformations to apply from our catalog we apply them really fast in memory, and we'll apply the exact same transformation at training time and at prediction time. That's another thing you don't have to worry about. And here again is a quick Python code snippet we call createMLModel API. Pass in the ID we want our model to have, the type of machine learning model, numeric regression in this case, and ID of the tr uh, data source pointing to our training data. Next up is the evaluation step. We built a model, but we don't know if it's good or not. Well, Amazon Machine Learning build includes uh, both uh, metric computation and visualization for different kinds of models you can build. So this is a visualization for a binary classification model, and I'll come back to that momentarily. Here is another one for a numeric regression model, and here is a third visualization for a multi-class classification model. We will go and take your evaluation data and compute a metric and the metric we pick is an industry standard metric. It's different for each kind of model, but it's industry standard. 
It's what your data scientists probably use today. And we'll compute a baseline. We'll tell you how much does this model outperform baseline. But really important step here is not merely to measure, but to consider what the costs of mistakes to your business are. So imagine we're looking at emails and we're predicting, is this email spam or not? Our model will make mistakes. All machine learning models make mistakes. Well, there are two kinds of mistakes it can make. It can make a false positive mistake where it looks at a normal email and says, that's spam, put it in the spam folder. It can make a false negative, uh, look at a spam email and says, nah, you know, that's, that's a good email. Let's put it into the inbox. I claim that one of these mistakes is much worse than the other. If I have a false positive, I'm taking a legitimate email that might be very important, putting it into my junk email folder, I'll never see it again. Who knows what I'm missing out on? Uh, could be very expensive. If I have a false negative, I have a spam that ends up in my inbox. It's annoying, but uh, you know, it kind of has a high bound on how much it's gonna cost me in annoyance to click and delete it. What you can do with Amazon Machine Learning is you can actually express this knowledge directly into the model. So here we have a slider. If you look at the bottom of the screen here, we have our false negative and false positive rates, assuming that we're going to get prediction, and what we're predicting really is what is the likelihood of this email being uh, fraudulent. It goes between zero and one. So by default, our threshold is 0 0.5, which is the same as saying, if we're at least 50% sure this email is fraudulent, go ahead and put it into the, uh, or if this, is this email spam, go ahead and put it into the spam folder. And at this 50% threshold, these are the uh, false positive and false negative rates we have. I don't have to accept that. I can say, you know what, I'm willing to tolerate more false negatives if it helps me get rid of some of the false positives. I can grab onto the slider here and move it around. And as I do, the numbers of false positives and false negatives change, change, and so does my threshold. So this is a really important step in actually making sure that your model not only works, not only is of high quality evaluated with an all-up metric, but is actually aligned to what's important to your business. All right, uh, we built our model, we evaluated, it's time to get some predictions. Two interface to get predictions, batch and real time. With batch, batch predictions, um, it's the best bet if your process outputs data records and batches, and you just want to call one API, let it go off and work asynchronously, and eventually come back with all predictions at once. Um, you can do this through the console, or you can call a um, single API, create batch prediction, and you configure the ID of the data source that contains the data records you want predictions for, and where to put the outputs. So here we put them in S3, and you get back a file that looks something like this. We have the score, and we have the answer, which is the score interpreted against uh, into zero or one. On the other hand, you have real-time predictions. If you have the kind of application that need, needs predictions in real time, for example, a web or mobile application, you can call an API with a single data record and immediately and synchronously get a prediction back. Vast majority of predictions will come back in under 100 milliseconds, and you can call this at high throughput. You can get hundreds of predictions per second if you need to. And here the API is really simple. You call the API called predict. You pass in a map of key value pairs and the response comes back immediately and the, uh, the output is directly there in response. All right, I have just a couple minutes left. I want to show you a couple of data flows, a couple of architecture patterns for smart applications. Here's a pattern that we see um, quite a bit of. We start off with some data that is stored in S3. We run an EMR job to aggregate and join this data with uh, other data sets and output, again, the aggregated data back into S3. Well, now that we have that aggregated data, it's obviously a batch of data records. We can easily call the get uh, batch prediction API. This works asynchronously and outputs, once it's done, it outputs all the predictions at once back into S3 where your application can pick them up. If your data lives in Redshift, it's much the same picture, only simpler. You start off with your data in Redshift. You can use Redshift's built-in facilities. You can write a SQL query, essentially, that joins the data, filters it, aggregates it in ways that, in whatever ways are needed. And then 
uh, you call the same Amazon Machine Learning Batch Prediction API to get predictions. Predictions are output in S3. You can pick them up and load them into your application. All right, this is the simplest diagram, architecture diagram I ever made. There is just one arrow here, <laughs> two endpoints. But a lot of applications really do look like this. You have an application, it needs to get predictions in real time. Well, all you have to do is call the uh, real-time endpoint of Amazon Machine Learning, get a prediction, and use it immediately. And here's an interesting scenario. Um, you can use this kind of functionality to retrofit existing applications that are not predictive today to become predictive. So imagine you have an application that collects data and writes it into a DynamoDB table. And that application is up and running today. It was written before you had any thoughts of uh, getting predictions on that data, but you want to get predictions. For example, you're collecting events from your application, and as an event comes in, you immediately want to predict, is this user in danger of churning? And if yes, do something about it. Well, what you can do is you can use Amazon Machine Learning together with AWS Lambda. You can register a Lambda event for a new row to, be, um, to, to fire every time a new row is written into DynamoDB. And the, um, the Lambda function will take that row and go and get a real-time prediction for it. And then you register a second event, um, a second Lambda function, to take that prediction and do something with it. Maybe you're gonna write it back into the same DynamoDB row. Maybe you're going to send an alert. Maybe you'll do something else. But your application, the application that collects the data and writes it, is unmodified. It is unaware that any of this is happening. But here you are. Uh, having retrofitted your application for predictive use case. All right, I'll stop here. I'm a little over time. Thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate you sticking around. Uh, happy to take questions. Um, there is a microphone over here. Or you can just shout out at me. If I may um, make one request, please remember to complete your evaluations. I would really appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Yeah, so the question was, uh, do we talk about which algorithms and what kinds of machine learning models we have in Amazon Machine Learning? And the answer is yes, we do. So Amazon Machine Learning today runs with a family of algorithms that are uh, uh, known in bulk as generalized linear models. We find the generalized linear models are wonderful algorithms. You know, they're not the best for every situation. No algorithm is. But we like them a lot because they work in a wide variety of use cases. They're fast. They're really robust. Um, and um, we find that combined with our data recipes, which are able to prepare the input data to work well with generalized linear models, they produce results very quickly. So that's the algorithm uh, that, we, that we have in the, um, in the system today. So the question is, do we expect to add more? Uh, it's something we always look at. It's something we always evaluate based on customer feedback. There is nothing about Amazon Machine Learning that says, well, that's just generalized linear model service. We've built our APIs to be very general. So we, all, we always are always looking at what would be the next worthwhile things to add. Question. Right. So the question was, if the model was built elsewhere, is there a way to bring it into Amazon Machine Learning so you can use the uh, uh, Amazon Machine Learning prediction platform? Uh, the, the answer is, uh, right now, today, there is not a way to do it. What we have seen is because we build generalized linear models that are very widely used and understood uh, in the industry, it is uh, perhaps not as convenient, but definitely feasible to take a model that was built elsewhere, bring in that data set, bring in similar settings to build in the model, and rebuild it inside Amazon Machine Learning you're not going to get a model that's identical because there will always be implementation differences. But under a normal circumstance, you'll get a model that is very similar. Yeah, but sometimes you have a problem with constraints where you don't actually read the data, so you can get the model. 
Right, um, yeah, if, if, if there are constraints around bringing the data in, but models are portable, it's not something we can support today, it's something that is uh, definitely something I think about. Uh, we would love to do that sometime in the future. Right, so, so the flip side, can we, t can we build a model in Amazon Machine Learning and then export it? And a similar answer, we don't have a model export functionality today. You can build a model that is similar to what you have built in Amazon Machine Learning on your own using your preferred toolkit. Uh, it may not have the same speed and scale and uh, other characteristics, but you're likely to achieve a very similar model. But there is not a direct way to take a model today and export it. Yes, sir. Right, so the question was, how, do, how, does, uh, how does Amazon Machine Learning take the input data and generate the feature set? Uh, there's kind of a multi-part answer to that. In the, um, in the most general sort of way, we do take all the data that you give us and we try to use it. One of the reasons we like generalized linear models so much is they're fairly robust to data that is irrelevant, especially when you use a feature called regularization, which is a part of Amazon Machine Learning and turned on by default, there is not a great danger in putting in data that is um, irrelevant. Beyond that, I've mentioned data recipes, and data recipes help us take the uh, raw data features and apply transformations to them that uh, make it easier for the machine learning uh, engine to learn. So I mentioned an example of taking a text variable and breaking it up into words or n-grams. And this kind of processing is under your control and there is some built-in processing supplied by default. So if you, if you give us a variable and you say it's text and you tell us nothing else, we will automatically break it up into individual words and we'll learn a weight for each word. But we have much more sophisticated feature processors built in and we have this concept of what we call a suggested data recipe. When you create your data source and you compute data statistics, we look at the input variables in your data and we suggest a data recipe that's unique and specific to that data input data file. So we'll look at a numeric variable and we'll say, this numeric variable, it makes sense to actually discretize it and quantile bin it, and the number of bins you should use is 50 for this variable or 100 for that variable. The suggested recipe is just that. It's suggested there by default. You don't have to use it. If you have used it, you can bring it up and see what, what it was and modify it in the next iteration to do something different. It's all built around the goal of helping you get value out of your data as quickly as possible. Um, the question was, do, does it mean that we have feature selection built uh, directly into Amazon Machine Learning? We don't have feature selection. What we do have is feature engineering and we rely in general on f things like regularization and model size control to weed out irrelevant features. So instead of being very explicit about it, we use these implicit methods which we find work well in many situations. So the question was, I'll re repeat for the camera, um, w how long does it take to actually do uh, the model training and other operations on large data sets? Um, the simple answer is it's directly proportional to the data size on disk. Uh, depending on the operation you call, some of the operations uh, will run in, uh, linearly in wall clock time, some, some will run sublinearly. Um, the data size is by and far the biggest uh, indication of how long it will take. And uh, beyond data size, probably the next most significant thing is feature transformation. Which transformation do you specified? So I hate to give the answer, it depends, but it really does depend. What you can reasonably count on is if you try it on a smaller data set, you should be able to uh, extrapolate to larger data sets. Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. So the question was, do we support deep learning algorithms in Amazon Machine Learning today? Uh, we do not today. It's another, it's definitely something we're thinking about, but it's not a part of the product today. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, can you um, give me an example? Uh, okay, so the question is, are there some use cases to which Amazon Machine Learning is not well suited? Um, you know, Amazon Machine Learning being a very horizontal classification and regression platform does not in and out of itself limit what it can be done with it. It's very use case agnostic and unaware. Um, the, uh, I would say that, uh, kind of in the spirit of the question, if you look at the data types that Amazon Machine Learning supports an input, we will take in uh, numerical data, categorical data, and free text data. And by the way, Amazon Machine Learning is actually really fantastic on completely unstructured text. But if your problem has the uh, kind of data type that is not one of these, if you're looking at, for example, image or speech, it's not that you cannot use Amazon Machine Learning with it. It means that you have to do the transformations to get it into one of these target data types yourself. So it's not as obvious as a fit today. And of course, on our side, we keep, uh, we definitely think about what other data types we want to support and what algorithms we'll bring in to support these and so on. But that's my answer as it exists today. Uh huh. Right, no, so we do not, we cannot take an image as a byte array today. Uh, we have had customers who've taken images and applied feature transformations to them that, that created categorical or numerical attributes out of that, and then you can use that with Amazon Machine Learning. But if you provide a direct byte stream as an input, you're not going to get anything worthwhile out of it. Right, so the, the question, let me repeat, make sure I understand. Uh, given that you have built a model and you're getting some results, how do you make this model better over time? Uh, this, the most direct answer is with better and more data. You know, we find that having good data and having lots of data beats almost anything else you can do. You know, it beats having really um, specialized algorithms, it beats uh, spending a lot of time trying to optimize the algorithm parameters, better data. Uh, something we find is that customers who build applications, predictive applications, now not only build the application, but they build additional channels to take in the data records. And so as they launch their applications, the amount of training data also goes up just implicitly. And that helps you get better data, better models over time. But that is, uh, you know, my number one answer is put in more and better data. Of course. Anybody else? I'll take uh, one more question, then I'll sh uh, give back the microphone, but I'll hang out here, so I'm happy to take more questions. Person? Yes? Uh, so from a data perspective, uh, I think we'll uh, uh, the legacy model very uh, I want a business part of data, and I'm one person of the legacy model, and this part of data is not my favorite. Uh, so the question is, can you use the same data set essentially to build multiple models? Uh, absolutely, you can. You can create a data source and then one of the operations you have available to you is to say, well, to ignore these data fields. Do not use them, do not look at them, just pass them through. You can, you can certainly combine the predictions in some way in your own code. You can run multiple models, get predictions, and then do something like, you know, do uh, majority voting. It's not something that's often done with linear models. You know, they're not the best kind of models for that kind of approach, but sometimes it's the right thing to do. Uh, there is nothing in the service specifically for that, but you, of course, have complete freedom to run the predictions as you see fit. 
All right, I'll turn off the microphone. Uh, coming up, if, uh, if there's anything else I can tell you, I'd be happy to.